Hello, and welcome to the program. I'm so glad you decided to join me today. The subject of spiritual warfare is one that every Christian needs to have a, a deeper understanding about, because we are in the last of the last days. In fact, we are in the last moments of the last days, and that last trump can sound at any time. So it's no time to be sitting on your hands in a comfort zone, in an attitude of complacency. No, there is a real spiritual war that is before us, and but you can rejoice because Jesus has already won the war. But we, as the members of the body of Christ, are to enforce it. We are to enforce that war that Jesus has already won because the enemy is out there. Yes, the devil is the god of this world, and he is out there, and he has a fierce agenda. But it won't succeed against you if, I'll remember the ifs, God's conditions, if you would do things God's way, if you will fight the good fight of faith. It's a good fight because we win, but we have to fight it. It's no, there's no um, a demilitarized zone, no neutral corner. No, every Christian, every born again, blood bought spiritual Christian is called to fight the good fight of faith. There is a real spiritual war. Spiritual warfare is not just something that is, you know, uh, a fairy tale or something that somebody just made up. It's very real. We are battling a very real enemy. But like I said, we can defeat him at every turn. Jesus already defeated the devil. When Jesus went to the cross, he already took you know, the keys of death, hell, and grave. When he went to the cross and, and uh, suffered and died and then was resurrected three days later. Think about it. And we have been given superior weapons. Yes, weapons of warfare to plunder the devil's camp. In a moment, I'm going to offer you a book where I go into detail about many of the spiritual weapons that we have been given to defeat the enemy. Because we need to know this. We need to know how the enemy works so that we can successfully successfully defeat him at every turn. Because he will try every trick in the book. But those things will not prosper in your life if you will do your part to know your weapons of warfare and to use them against the enemy. In 2 Corinthians 10... 3 through 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. See, we have to understand that even though we are walking in the flesh, obviously we're still in the flesh until we're glorified and raptured. We're still in this flesh. But the war that we are waging is not according to the flesh. The war we are waging is according to, you know, demonic principalities and powers. We are dealing with the devil himself. But, like I said, we can overcome him because we've been given weapons of warfare. And the weapons we have been given are not carnal, as the Bible says. It means they're not physical, natural weapons, because those things can't do anything to the enemy. But the weapons that will defeat him and will defeat his cohorts are the spiritual weapons that we've been given. And as we looked at in previous programs, we've been given weapons like the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, the armor of God, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've been given uh, the weapon of Worship and endless with God. That's a weapon because, like I said, you know, in, in the previous uh, program, is because when we are spending time in God's presence, guess what? That thwarts the enemy because the enemy wants all the praise. The enemy wants to be the one magnified. Well, don't don't do that. You magnify God. You use this word of God and all the other weapons against Him. In this program, we're going to be looking at some more of these weapons that we've been given. And to have a, a deeper understanding, I, I encourage you to get the book, my book that I'm going to offer you in a moment so that you can have all the knowledge so that you can successfully give the devil a black eye at every turn. Now, you don't have to be under the devil's thumb. You can be one who dominates every circumstance, one who takes authority. See, we've been given authority over the enemy and not just, you know, over just a little parts of what he does. No, we've been given authority over all that he would try to do in our lives to tear us down. But the only way that he can tear us down is if you give him an open door. We're not giving him an open door. You have been called and anointed for battle. So don't let the devil take advantage of you. No, you rise up as the member of the body of Christ, the army of God that you are called to be, and you take authority over him. In this teaching, we're going to look at six, 
uh, three more weapons that I talk about in the book, and one of them is called is uh, praise. It says praise is a spiritual weapon against the enemy. There is a dynamic and a warfare in praise because when you praise God, guess what? That puts the enemy to flight. Just just like with worship and intimacy, when we are praising God, guess what? That plunders the devil's agenda because just like the devil wants to be worshipped and, and uh, lifted up. That way, he also wants to be praised. Well, don't give him that that upper hand. No, you praise God, and when you praise God, that will that will just put a death blow in the enemy's face. Because praise is a powerful weapon we've been given to praise God. Because praise activates God to move in your life. That brings Him upon the scene to be able to help you to overcome, to cause you to be more than a conqueror. Because praise is something that, in fact, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And when praise to God is lifted up, guess what? The devil has to flee the other way because he can't stand. Just like he can't stand in the atmosphere of true worship, he can't stand in the atmosphere of true praise. When believers are praising God, the enemy and his demons can't stand in that place. So what, so what better way that we can get him out of our business by being those who are thankful people, people who are praisers? In Second Chronicles, we're going to look at Second Chronicles, which is one of the, the greatest, I, I say this all the time, one of the greatest areas of this understanding of the warfare of praise that we, that we can you, you know, use against the enemy. In Second Chronicles 20, and I'm just giving you a head, headlines on this program. I encourage you to get my book that I'm going to offer you and wait for battle so you can have you know, a more deeper understanding of this. But for now, I want to give you some of the headlines so you can have, you know, an understanding of the weapons that you've been given. Because a lot of people, you know, they say, well, you know what, I hear about these weapons, but what are they? Well, I, on this program, in my book, I want to show you what these weapons are so that you can have that clear understanding. So you don't have to feel like you, you know, are, are left without. No, you've been given so many weapons. It's up to you to know what they are and to use them. You know, and that's, if you don't use them, then guess what, then they won't be able to you know, bring the victory in their in to your life that God, you know, has made them to be. Because He's established these weapons so that you can be able to conquer, to overcome, to be victorious. Second Chronicles twenty, uh, verse thirteen and, and onward says, "Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite." of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. He said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor be dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the work before the wilderness of Jeruel. You do not need to fight in this battle Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. Now they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, and who should praise the beauty of holiness. As they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. And you can read the rest of that. I stopped at 22. You can read the rest of it all the way down to 30. Think about it. It was when the, the, when the uh, singers were sent out ahead of the army to praise the Lord and to worship the beauty of his holiness that God came upon the scene and set an ambush against their enemies, and their enemies were defeated. Well, guess what? When we begin to praise God... Think about it. It brings him upon the scene and he will set an ambushment against the devil and his demons and they will be defeated because that's how powerful praise is. In fact, we can praise our way into the victory. 
But it's not going to happen if you have your mouth closed and if you're just being one who murmurs and complains all the time. No, we're to be thankful people. We're to be those who are praisers, praisers of God. Like last time we looked at worship. We're to be worshipers of God. We're also to be praisers. Think about it. Because that will put another death blow to the enemy's agenda. Because he's out there and he wants all the praise. Well, don't give it to him. Don't give the devil praise. No, you give the praise where it's supposed to be, to God. And when you praise God, think about it. That will bring him upon the scene, just like God is moved by our faith, because faith brings him on the scene. Praise also brings him upon the scene, too, because as it says in Psalm 22, he inhabits or is enthroned upon the praises of his people. And when you are in that, 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 that attitude of thankfulness, like I said, there is a warfare in praise. And he will come upon the scene. And that will cause the enemy to be defeated and put to flight. So yes, praise is one of the greatest weapons. I always say, I say that about every one of them because all of them are the greatest weapons. We've been given superior weapons to plunder the devil's agenda. And that's why I want you to really have a deeper understanding of this. Don't be one who is destroyed for lack of knowledge. No. And, and you have to have the knowledge of God's word, the knowledge of the weapons that he has given you. So many of them. And like I said, I go into greater detail in, in the book I'm going to offer you. So I encourage you to get that so you can have that, that resource to be able to refer back to. Get your Bible and, and, and my book and just study and start understanding that you have authority over the devil. You have authority over his demons. You have authority. In fact, in the book, I go into different areas of authority that we've been given. Authority over you know uh, sin. Authority over poverty and lack. Authority over the weather, authority over the devil himself and demons and so forth. Because we need to know this so that we're not those who are browbeated and just left in that place where we feel like we have to give up. No, don't give up. You press forward as the anointed army of God because you have been given superior weapons like praise. Another one is Psalms 149, 5 and 9, 5 through 9, excuse me. Says, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all of his saints. Praise the Lord. Now think about it. It says that with the high praises of God in our mouth, as God's saints, his mem the members of his body, praise on our lips, coming out of our mouth in faith. It says that it is like a, a, a two-edged sword in the hand. Just like the word of God is, is a two-edged sword. Well, the word of God and praise coming out of our mouth. Think about it. That's double ammunition against all the forces of darkness. Think about it. We are to execute this. That's how we execute vengeance on those uh, demonic forces and principalities that come against us by speaking God's word, by being those who praise God. And when we praise God, think about it. It brings him upon the scene, like I said, and it will cause the enemy to turn the other way. He's defeated. His plans are destroyed because he can't stand in the atmosphere of praise that's lifted up to God. Because Satan, who was originally Lucifer, fell because of pride. He wanted to be exalted above God. He wanted all the praise. He wanted all the worship. He wanted to be, you know, the one, the, the big guy. Well, it didn't work. There's only one, you know, who is the true God, the true and mighty risen God. And there is no other. So the enemy was cast down. Lucifer was cast down and became Satan. And ever since that time, he has concocted an agenda to get you off course, to take his bait, to try to be, you know, lured into his web, his web of deceit and, and um, uh, all kinds of just junk. Well, don't allow that to be something that is a part of your life. Don't allow yourself to be moved by every wind of doctrine, by every, you know, uh, whistle and trolley cart that comes along that looks like it could be something right. No, the enemy will appear as an angel of light. That's why we need to know how he operates so that we can successfully defeat him. Because spiritual warfare was only going to be successful when we do it God's way. And when we understand who we are in Christ and the weapons we've been given, as such as praise. Another one of the weapons that we've been given, the weapons of warfare, is the prayer of agreement. This is one that is so, so, uh, in many places, poorly taught. Because a lot of people just think that just everybody that names the name of Jesus just come together and God has to, to answer those prayers. God has to just, no. 
it's the prayer of agreement, and that's talking about full agreement. In Matthew 18, 19 and 20. Matthew 18, 19 and 20. Jesus said, Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. That means if two or more believers are gathered together in his name. That's talking about the prayer of agreement. Now that word agree or agreement in this passage is talking about harmony. It's talking about making a symphony. Well, think about in the natural realm. If uh, musicians are coming together to form a symphony and one, and one of them is off key, well, guess what? That sour note is just going to ruin everything. Well, when there are members of the body of Christ or those are people who are coming together and there's a sour note in the symphony, that's going to cause the, the prayer to be negated. That means when it's talking about the prayer of agreement, it's talking about when believers come together of like precious faith, who when they're coming together to agree in prayer about a certain subject or situation, that they are both in agreement with what's being prayed for. That means both of them have pure doctrine and they come into agreement with each other. But first, they're in agreement with God. See, if we're not in agreement with God, if we all have different doctrines and one person believes in divine healing, the other person doesn't, well, how will those two people come together in agreement about the manifestation of your healing or another of their brain for healing? No, it won't happen. Everybody has to come together in total agreement. But not only what's being prayed for at the moment, but the entire word of God. If somebody comes into so-called agreement with another believer, but that other believer has false doctrine, and guess what? That's going to negate those prayers. That's why a lot of times prayers go unanswered because there's not full agreement. Like I said, we have to come into agreement with God, his word, and his word, which are one and the same. And then we come into agreement with each other. Those who are on the same page as we are. Those who are in agreement with the full counsel of God's word. And when we do, Jesus said, then I'm there in the midst because that's how you come together in his name. When you are in total harmony, you harmonize together and you form that supernatural symphony. There's no sour notes. And guess what? He said it shall be done because that's full agreement. And that's how we can give another, you know, uh, sock in the devil's face is by coming to agreement with God's word. He says, when you agree concerning anything or as the King James says, as touching anything and means whatever you come together and grasp, a hold up, surround. He said, Jesus said, it shall be done. It shall. He said, for where two are gathered together or more gathered together. Together in my name, I'm there in the midst. If they agree on earth concerning or asking anything, it shall be done by the Father in heaven. That's talking about true agreement. And Amos says, How can two walk together unless they're agreed? It's not, well, you know what? Well, I believe in healing, but the other person doesn't. But that's the person you want to come together as a prayer partner? No. We have to choose our prayer partners wisely. We have to be in agreement. Or if it's just you, come, you know, praying about a situation or yourself, then you better be in agreement with God's word not have any doubt. If there's any doubt, then guess what? That's going to negate your prayers. You have to live and walk by faith and agree with the full counsel of God's word and then come into agreement with those who are in agreement with the full counsel of God's word. See, that's the prayer of agreement. And then in 1 John 5, we're going to see the result of that agreement, the result of that type of prayer being prayed. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That's the result of this symphony, that harmonized symphony of agreement, the prayer of agreement being prayed. It says we can have confidence in God that when we ask according to his will, what is his will? His word. When we ask According and pray according to what he already has revealed to us in his word about any subject such as healing. He's already said that it's done. Jesus says that, you know, it says that by his stripes we were and are healed. That means if we were and we are, we still are. So you can come into agreement that Jesus has already paid for your healing or whatever area because it's in his will. It's not like these people say, well, Lord, if it be your will, heal me. No, that is, uh, that is a recipe for disaster. No, he's already said it's his will. And his word is forever settled in heaven. To never pray prayers that say, if it be your will. When it's something that's already said in his word that it's already his will. That's why a lot of people never see answers to their prayers. Because they're praying prayers that, 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 that God can't answer. It's not that he, you know, 
not able to answer prayer. Yes, he is. But if you're praying things that are contrary to his word, things that are in doubt and unbelief, then guess what? He, he can't he can't answer those prayers because it, 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 he won't do it because he will never violate his word. But when you pray what he's already said to you that is yours in his word, guess what? He will do it because that's it's a promise and he'll never go back on his promises. God is not a man that he should lie. He is absolute. And when you pray according to his will, his word, come into agreement with it, guess what? It will be done. Not my, it will. That's why we need to have that understanding of this uh, weapon of the prayer of agreement. See, a lot of people don't realize it's a weapon. It is because when believers, and the more you come into agreement with each other, that unity, the Bible says there, that, that the anointing is present when uh, brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like, you know, the anointing, the oil of the Holy Spirit going from the top of your head right down to the very soles of your feet. Read it in Psalms 133. And in that place of unity is God's commanded blessing. Think about it. So yes, the prayer of agreement is a spiritual weapon that we can use against the enemy to defeat him, to plunder everything that he has out there to try to, like I said, get you off course. So we need to understand this. I go into detail, greater depth on all these subjects in my book that I'm going to offer you. Uh, another one of the weapons we've been given is, which also actually goes together with the prayer of agreement, is binding and loosing. And just before that verse we read in Matthew, it he talks about binding and loosing. But even before that, the first time he mentions it, in uh, the understanding of what it is, as we're going to see um, uh, in Matthew 12 in a moment, but in Matthew 16, let's just go there, 16, 13 through 19, we see what we have been given as keys of the kingdom. He says, and I will give you, Jesus says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But notice in that scripture, and also in Matthew 18, 18, we have to do the binding and loosing. God's not going to do it for us, but he will back us up. It means whatever we bind is bound. Whatever we loose is loosed. See, a lot of people want to just put all the responsibility on God and think that they're not supposed to do anything. They're just supposed to sit back and all these things are to fall in their hands. No, we have to do our part. We've been given that free will, but we need to use it. We need to use our authority. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And we have to understand that that uh, there are three heavens. There's the first heavens, the you know the atmospheric heavens. Then the second heaven, which, which is the wicked heaven. That's that lower rung that that is marked out. That's you know where our all of our problems are coming from. That is where hell is. That is the wicked heavens. That's where Satan, the prince of the power of the air, and his principalities and powers and mights and dominions and stuff, they operate in that area. And then way, way, way above that is the third heaven. That's God's perfect heaven. So we're not binding and loosing there. No, we are binding and loosing in the second heaven because that's where the source of our problem is coming from, where the enemy is dwelling. And he sends his demons here on the earth too because they're looking for a host. They want to try to see if they have an opening so they can come in and wreak havoc. That's why we need to understand that we've been given the keys of binding and loosing as a spiritual weapon. You have to bind the enemy. And once you bound him or any foul spirit, and I go, I'm not going to get into a lot in this program, but when you get the book, I go into detail of what the understanding of binding and loosing is and how that we, once we do that, once we do bind a certain foul spirit, then we have to also loose the opposite. Because a lot of people bind, but they forget to loose. Well, if you bind, say, for instance, a spirit of infirmity, well, you need to remember to loose the gifts of healing. See, for every foul spirit that you bind, you need to loose the opposite. It means you need to loose, you know, God's perfect will into the situation. See, that's another aspect of binding and loosening that a lot of people never really have an understanding about or they've been fully taught about. In Matthew 12, as I mentioned a moment ago, in verse 29, Jesus says, Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods? Unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. First, we have to bind the strong man. The strong man, that is the root spirit. A lot of times people just get to the lesser ones, but they never get to what I call the head honcho. Well, we need to get to the head honcho. We need to bind the, the, the root of it. 
and then we can start dealing with the lesser ones. But until you get the root of it, those lesser ones are just going to keep multiplying and multiplying. No, we have to bind foul spirits because the devil has sent so many of them out there to try to destroy your life. Well, you have authority over them, the authority of the believer to trample upon all the enemy's forces of darkness. And nothing will hurt you. Why? Because you're going in the strength and the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to understand this. We've been given keys. We, we don't have, you know, just a, a couple of weapons and that's it. And God says, well, you know what? You have to defend for yourself, you know, with whatever's left. No. Because what's on this earth is just a bunch of, it's just a bunch of piddly physical weapons. Those things don't do anything to the enemy. But the weapons that do are the ones that God says in his word. The weapons of our warfare that pull down strongholds, that that um, uh, just cause the enemy to be defeated, to be shred, to be cut up in pieces. Like I said, so many weapons we've been given. And that's why I want you to have a deeper understanding of this. That's why I want you to, you know, have this resource that I'm going to offer you. So please get my book, Anointed for Battle. This is an essential in time spiritual warfare manual. Like I said, I go into deep, deep detail uh, about many of the weapons we've been given, like the ones we looked at today, praise and uh, prayer of agreement and binding and loosing, and the others we've looked at in previous programs, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, uh, the word of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit, uh, and the, like I said, every piece of the armor also go into the ministry of deliverance and our understanding of our faith and confession. So many weapons that we've been given. So there's no excuse to say, well, I just I just don't know how to go forth into battle. I just don't know how to win against the, the enemy and his forces. No, no, there's no excuse. So please get this book and learn and start walking as, you know, the true army of God. Start using your authority, that blood block, blood bought spiritual gift that you've been given in Christ Jesus to defeat the enemy because you have truly been anointed for battle. Just go on to the uh, description on this, this uh, program on the uh, description page and click on the, the Amazon link that will direct you to the buying link. They're on Amazon so you can get this book and start learning today how you can have be successful in spiritual warfare every time, not just occasionally or not at all. No, every time because you have truly been called and anointing for battle. So please get this book. And John 8.32, you know, is very, very much quoted, you know, in Christian circles. But a lot of people forget the cause and effect that's in this verse because they forget the verse that's before it, 31. So I want to read John 8.31 and then 32 and then 36. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, notice the if again, cause and effect. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then 36 says, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Free indeed. But a lot of people says, How? it's like, oh, you know what? I, I know that stuff, but I'm still going through, you know, different things in my life. I'm still going around mountains. There's still... I still have the devil, you know, you know, just always in my face. Well, there's a reason. There's something that you've allowed. Why? Because if you are truly free, then guess what? Those things are not going to, yeah, they're going to come. They're going to try to attack you at every turn. It doesn't matter who you are. But if you are truly in that place of freedom, then those things won't, you know, uh, affect you in the sense that they won't get you down. They won't prosper in your life. Oh, yeah, they'll try to do everything they can to tear you down. But guess what? You'll just laugh in their face. The reason is because a lot of people forget, like I said, that Jesus preached cause and effect. He says, if you abide in my word. See, there's the key. We have to abide in God's word. He said, then you're my disciples indeed. And the truth that you know means you know it, you walk in it, you put it into practice, will make you free. And you will be free indeed. See, it's the truth that we know. It's the truth we walk in. See, just saying, oh, yeah, well, I heard that man talking about, you know, the spiritual weapons and yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you go about and but you never use the weapons. You just hear a bunch of messages about the weapon, but you never use them. You never put them into practice. That's why you're not free, because you're just, you know, hearing a, a lot of things, but you're not being doers of the word. Well, in James, it says that we're not to just be hearers, but we're to do the word. 
First, we hear it, absolutely, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Not having had heard once and then just forgiven. No, we have to hear and hear and then do and do. That's how we're going to be made free. By continuing to abide in this word. God's word is his will. And when we walk in it and when we apply it, guess what? That's how we're going to be able to have success in spiritual warfare and success in just our everyday walk of faith. So we need to get this. We need to understand this. So don't be, allow the devil to cheat you out of your full inheritance in Christ. Don't allow the devil to put all this garbage on you to make you feel like you know you just have to give up. No, don't give up. That's what the devil wants. That's what he's counting on. No, you've been anointed for battle. And like I said, Jesus already won the war, but we have to enforce it because we're still in this world and the devil is still out there raging and doing what he does best, which is to prowl around like a roaring lion, seeking someone he may devour. That means he needs your permission. Well, don't give him your permission. You rise up and take your rightful authority over him because that's who you are in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. You are an overcomer. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You've been anointed and equipped for battle. So don't stand in a comfort zone. Don't stand in a place of a feeling like you, you just don't know what, which way to turn. No, God's word will show you which way to turn. So really start taking this seriously and start understanding the authority that you've been given. Start understanding that that you can defeat the enemy. If you will use your weapon, first know what the weapons are and then use them. And that's how you're going to be successful in your Christian walk and in spiritual warfare and any other area of life. So please take this seriously. And please order that book so that you can have that resource to help you and to equip you to move forward as a member of the army of God. So please really take this seriously. And always remember Isaiah 40, verse 8. The word of God stands forever. Amen.